A family thankful to be alive after dodging bullets as they got ready for school and work. A mother crediting her television for saving her life. We're going to take you to this scene for details on what police say happened. A few seconds is not worth putting your life at risk. And a reminder why traffic laws are laws. A car cut in half by a train in Florida. The man's survival story coming up in your morning headlines. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, February 17th. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Yeah, what I said a second ago still applies. Good morning. It still applies. It's still good morning. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Crazy changes in the weather. I mean, woke up this morning because we get here pretty early and it was like humid, almost warm outside. Yeah, on the earlier newscast, Mike was talking about two stages of changes, but the overriding concern today is fire danger. Let's go outside with live cam right now. And Justin Horn joins us. Hey there, guys. Yeah, you're exactly right. You guys nailed the forecast here. We're going to see those gusty winds kick in today. The high fire danger is there. The skies have cleared. You can see clear skies out there. And one thing I want to alert you of is by tomorrow morning, you'll want to dress the kids warm. We will see some significant changes. So let's look at the sort of temperature change here. 76 degrees today. We reached that early afternoon. By tomorrow morning, wind chill values will be in the 20s. So dig those jackets out once again. You'll want them tomorrow morning. Here's the setup. You can see the rain moving east across parts of East Texas, Louisiana. By and large, we missed out on the rain, of course. Uh, you see some snow up there across parts of Oklahoma. So the initial front there has moved through. What that means is we'll get some dry air, still some warm temperatures today. And then that secondary front you see move, moving south, just north of Dallas, that will bring in the cooler air a little bit later tonight. 66 degrees right now, 59 Bernie stays, 61 up in comfort, some 70s down around Stinson, 71 there, 67 Del Rio, and 70 down in Catua. There is a red flag warning in effect today. What does that mean? Just means we have a high fire danger. Gusty winds, low humidity, those two things combined means that anything that develops wildfire-wise would spread very quickly. Pollen count is in, a ton there. Moles lead the way, but elm, mulberry, and ash show up for the first time in a long time. So a laundry list there in your pollen count. Here's the forecast. 72 around noontime, but by this evening, those temperatures are already falling. We'll see gusts up to 35 miles per hour with the wind. And as we said, some wind chills by tomorrow morning in the 20s with low temperatures tomorrow morning in the 30s. We'll have much more on this coming up in just a bit. But we got to check in with Stephen now and see what's going on on the roadways. Good morning, yeah. sir. Yeah, and all those uh, 18 wheelers and buses make sure to drive carefully out there with those gusty winds. Uh, let's take a look right now with Trans Guy 90 West at Zazamoda is the problem spot at this hour. You can see that we do have at least three lanes of traffic are blocked at this hour due to a crash that's occurred in these eastbound lanes of 90. Now, keep in mind, this is coming into San Antonio, so you can see right there where that buildup is starting to happen right at Nogolitos. We'll watch it closely throughout the morning and give you the updates. It doesn't look like it's a drastic buildup, but definitely something drivers would probably want to avoid drive up here does show still a big slowdown off 1604 eastbound at Kyle Seal Parkway. Earlier there was a crash that was listed out there, but there is some projects going on uh, around 1604 specifically with the bridge widening that's been taking place out there around this time. So that could be why we're still seeing a build up there. So just be on the lookout overall, though, it does look like we're improving here on the map and it does show a slight slowdown there over in the uh, northeast side, but we'll keep an eye on things and give you those updates throughout the day. Mark Stephanie. Thank you, Stephen. A West Side woman still shaking after dodging bullets in her own living room. She says those shots were fired into her apartment by someone she does not know. This happened at an apartment complex not far from Casterville Road and Couples Road. Katrina Weber tells us a woman credits her television for saving her life. I had a chance to speak to the woman who lives here. She says this started with someone banging on her door early this morning and ended with gunfire exploding through her window. She didn't want to give her name or show her face, but she says the only reason she still was able to tell her story was because of her brand new television. It was sitting in front of her window when bullets tore into it before seven this morning, stopping them from hitting her. The woman told police she had just answered her door in the 100 block of Ocasa Walk and told two men who were banging on it that they had the wrong house. They were asking for someone who didn't live there. Suddenly, she says they fired through her window. She ducked down, then headed straight upstairs to her two-year-old son, dodging flying glass fragments along the way. The shooting left her nerves shattered. 
Police say the last time anyone saw the gunman, they were running from this apartment to a dark colored car and driving off. Reporting from the West Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. And let's look at today's Nine at Nine. The state of Texas is suing the Biden administration to overturn the president's federal mass mandate for public transportation. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton described the measure as disrespectful of the U.S. Constitution. The state's lawsuit alleges that Biden's order, which he issued just after taking office, is a violation of U.S. law and unconstitutional. The Russian military has released videos claiming its forces are withdrawing from Ukraine's border. However, new satellite images show Russia's army is continuing to build. The White House estimates as many as 7,000 additional troops have been added. And today, the UN Security Council will meet to debate the Minsk agreement between Russia and Ukraine, an agreement that could end the conflict. California will become the first state to officially begin shying away from the pandemic. Today, state leaders are expected to unveil plans to enter the endemic stage. Governor Gavin Newsom says COVID-19 still exists in the community, but officials have everything they need to combat the virus. Mass testing and vaccine sites will remain open, and masks are still required in places like schools and public transit. At least 94 people are dead after heavy rain swept across parts of Brazil, causing historic flooding in Rio de Janeiro. Mudslides buried homes and cars, leaving many with no time to escape. Rescue crews are still digging through the aftermath, and officials expect the death toll to rise. Loved ones will gather today to remember Amir Locke, the 22-year-old man killed by Minneapolis police during a pre-dawn no-knock raid earlier this month. Protests have continued for nearly two weeks in the Twin Cities over Locke's killing and the use of no-knock raids. Gas in California hit a record average high of $4.72 a gallon on Wednesday, and experts say a whopping $5 a gallon will likely be the norm in a matter of months. If not sooner, here in San Antonio, prices are averaging around $3. Google now says it's coming up with new ways to slow down how advertising companies track people across several apps. The change comes to Android following similar restrictions put in place by Apple last year. Tiger Woods says he's hopeful but unsure if he will be ready to return to the PGA Tour. The golf icon says he's frustrated with the progress of his recovery since a car crash near Los Angeles last year. Wood suffered serious leg injuries in a rollover accident and says even walking is challenging. Woods is a five-time Masters winner. Disney lovers may soon be able to live in neighborhoods dreamed up by the company. The parent of ABC now says it's working on developing residential communities. They're called Story Living by Disney. The first planned for California's Coachella Valley. And that's today's Nine at Nine. In your morning headlines, dash cam video shows a driver slammed by oncoming traffic during a stop and a car is cut in half after a train slams into it, one on the railroad tracks. Plus the push to create a federal no-fly list and for violent and disruptive passengers. Our mate Che Marquez joins us live with those stories and much more. Hey RJ, good morning. Yeah, good morning guys. Some uh, pretty incredible dash cam video to show you here from two separate incidents and let's go ahead and start first with this one out of Colorado and right here a perfect example of why tech Texas here at home has a state law that requires drivers to get over when they see emergency vehicles on the side of the road. Check out this video. The Colorado State Police released this video to make a point about highway safety. So first, it seems like a normal traffic stop. The trooper, the trooper talks with the driver and then walks back to his patrol car. You see that right there. And that's when things take an ugly turn. Look at that. In a matter of milliseconds, a car slams into the back of that stop vehicle, sending it flying down the interstate. Luckily, the trooper was out of the way. He runs over to check on the drivers. And look at that. Wow, that's a pretty heavy impact there. They say nobody was seriously hurt in this crash. But again, just a terrifying reminder to always pay attention on the road roads, especially the highways, especially when you see emergency vehicles. Glad to hear that everyone got it out, got it, made it safe. Okay there. Okay, from that scary reminder to this one right here, check the, this video behind me. You're looking at dash cam footage from a freight train in West Palm Beach, Florida. Everything running smooth right there on the tracks until the train enters the intersection and a car, check this out, Mm, right there. Car pulls right in front of the train trying to get past the flashing lights and the guardrails. The car was actually cut in half, but the driver rushed to a hospital nearby where doctors say that he miraculously survived. The man's family was also in shock once they learned of this news. I think it's a miracle, oh my God. 
it's crazy. Most people don't survive things like that, especially if the car is like split in half. Obey all signs and warnings. Obey the crossing arms if they're down. Obey the lights. A few seconds is not worth putting your life at risk. Yeah, always a scary situation when you try and beat the train. So this is actually not the first incident involving a train and car in West Palm Beach. There have been three other crashes over the past four days. Tuesday, a car got stuck on the tracks and the woman had to ditch the vehicle. And Sunday, a man was killed after his vehicle was hit on railroad tracks there. Okay, switching gears a little bit here. COVID cases are dropping across the country, and while more states are ending their mask mandates, top health experts say it's still too soon to stop masking kids in school. The White House says it's planning to, to distribute high-quality masks to kids in the next few days. The plan is an extension of the effort to distribute 400 million free N95 high-quality masks. Only three state states and Puerto Rico have yet to announce an end to mask mandates, and the CDC is not changing its mask guidance not yet anyway, especially when it comes to children. It is really not prudent to pull masks off children. You could create a risk that you would see an increase in infections. All right, health, top health officials there also saying that many kids from the ages of 5 to 11 are still not yet vaccinated and there is no COVID-19 vaccine authorized for those under 5 years old. Okay, guys, so a lot of people are already anxious about flying these days. I just uh, took a round trip the other day, and yeah, it's a little bit nerving sometimes. And new numbers about unruly passengers on flights are definitely not helping out. So the Federal Aviation Administration reported nearly 500 incidents so far just this year. That's in six weeks of unruly passengers. And earlier this week, you remember we told you about a man trying to open the door of an American Airlines flight. Saw him right there. The flight crew had to use a coffee pot just to hold him down. So now some airlines are calling on the Justice Department for help. The FAA handed dozens of cases to the Department of Justice to bring charges against those accused of assaulting fellow passengers and flight crews. Airlines have also asked the Justice Department to also create a federal no-fly list for these types of passengers. The flight attendants who are working these flights have been punched, kicked, spit on, uh, disrespected, and constantly uh, under assault. Until we have people actually landing in jail and understanding that there's real consequences for acting out on a flight, we're not going to see these incidents go down. So the DOJ says it is working with other, other federal agencies on the possibility of creating a no-fly list. For now, airlines are allowed to create their own ban, but that doesn't stop passengers banned from one airline from buying a ticket on another. And there's the rub right there. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, I fortunately have never had an unruly passenger on one of my flights, so right. knock on wood about that. But I could imagine it's just a scary situation, especially mid-flight, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. You, uh, you bet. Post 9-11, a lot of folks ready to yes. step up and help in situations like that. Absolutely. Definitely, right, yes. Thank you very much, RJ. Right now, 9-11. How, that's weird. That 66 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. Uh, there are tons of new food options to try at the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. And later, our David Sears will take a look around the food court for a look at what you can expect. But first, we take you underground. Crews making sure caves that feed San Antonio's main water supply stay clean. We'll show you how they do that next. We continue our coverage of San Antonio's water supply. Last week, Justin Horn and Sarah Spivey told you how rain flows through area cave systems and recharges the Edwards Aquifer. So it, it's important to keep trash out of caves because after all, it's part of our drinking water. And John Paul Barajas and photojournalist Adam Barraza joined a local cave cleaning crew as they went underground in Comal County. Right click this through there. Get the harness set up. Doing really well. Are you lying to me, Gary? No, no, you are. <laughs> this is the trashy room. This is a common sight in a lot of caves and sinkholes. All sorts of trash, some old and rusted, some still new and shiny. All the debris scattered along the path water flows through before recharging Edwards Aquifer, San Antonio's main source of drinking water. A lot of the rainwater, you know, washes into these caves and they eventually get to our, you know, drinking water eventually. So we want, uh, we don't want the, all the trash to be the part of the filtration system. Some of them had like, like gasoline or gas. So those are really, you know, like toxic, toxic waste. 
Dr. Mio Quintano works with the Bear Grotto, a caving group that helps keep caves clean and our water quality high like it currently is. She let us get a first-hand look at a cave cleaning operation in Kamau County. Right now, we're about 45 to 50 feet deep in the cave, and this is one of the messiest rooms in the cave. You can see all the trash here, all the different clutter, glass bottles, tin cans. You'll find some random items like this. This is, appears to be a toy cash register. Then you also have more hazardous things that our water actually filters through before going into Edwards Aquifer. And this right here is toilet bowl cleaner. It actually has danger and poison on it. A lot of this stuff has been here for generations, some of it almost 150 years old. They've been dumping trash and it was the, just the dumping ground. And then it's only recently that, that really they realized that the importance of cave conservation. Oh, oh Lord Jesus. <laughs> she explained back in the day, it was an out of sight, out of mind mentality. Using caves as essentially a dumpster was common practice. But now with cave conservation awareness, some private landowners invite crews to help with cleanings. We had a rope um, where we were hauling buckets up and down, um, just, you know, full of trash. They don't have an exact number, but believe hundreds of pounds of trash was cleared out in just this one day. <laughs> Dr. Quintano says they'll probably need a couple more cleanings before they're completely done with this cave. If you're interested in trying to help them out with this type of work, you can visit the Bear Grotto website. We'll have that website link on our website, KSAT.com. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Pretty fascinating stuff. Jo Justin joins us now. And mm -hmm. Justin, did you see along with us there, it looked like some of that, and of course it's been decades, some of that trash, trash may have been embedded into the rock. Yeah, oh, yeah. for a long time. Were uh, you surprised? For many years, people have, have used these as kind of trash receptacles, even going back into history. And mm -hmm. so that's why these cleanups are so important. And they really do help because you know, this gets into our water supply. So it's, it's, it's important work. And uh, yeah. we, we ran an excerpt of it this morning. I understand this group uh, is always looking for extra helping hands. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what it sounds like. So Bear Grotto, and I believe, as JP mentioned, that, that uh, their website, the link to their website, you can find on ksat.com. That's our understanding as well. Yeah, so good stuff. Uh, looks like it was kind of fun rebelling down into the cave too. That's, that's part of it. Uh, let's talk weather now, guys. So where are we headed today as far as we're going to see some cooler weather, yes, by tonight. But the bigger story today is going to be the dry air and gusty winds. We're already starting to see some of that. Here's the setup. You see the snow up across parts of Oklahoma and Kansas, and then rain from Arkansas to Louisiana. There's going to be some severe weather today, I think, as you go across the southeast. In fact, a pretty good risk of it from Memphis across parts of Mississippi and Alabama. We are not in that risk. In fact, now that the dry air started moving in, and this is kind of like a dry line, uh, we'll call it a Pacific front. It basically is just ushering in drier air. And then here's the actual cold front that will move through a little bit later tonight. In between these two features here, we have the very dry air starting to move in, and we're going to get some gusty winds and some warm temperatures today. So the, all those combine to create a fire danger, and that's kind of what we're concerned about. You look at the dew points now falling off into the 20s and 30s, and yes, that air is uh, really, really drying out quickly. And here's a look at the forecast wind gusts. We'll see some gusts close to 25, I think, this afternoon. This is around midday. Then as the front comes in, we'll see the, the wind switch around to the north and probably actually pick up a little bit more tonight. We could see some gusts 30 to 35 during the overnight hours. And then by tomorrow morning, we're still seeing some gusty winds, and that's going to create a wind chill. So these winds aren't going to die down really anytime soon. Maybe by tomorrow afternoon, we'll see a little bit less in the way of wind. Add into all of this, the fact that we still have drought conditions underway here across South Texas. This is the latest drought monitor just came in. In our areas that we've been seeing drought for some time now, still in the same situation. Severe uh, drought uh, to extreme drought down around Criso Springs and Catula. San Antonio just on the edge here, but we got to be careful even here in town with the way conditions are today. Red flag warnings in effect from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. This includes the entire area. And what is a red flag warning? It just means there's a high fire danger because of all those things we just explained. There's the scene outside, 66 degrees, northwesterly winds at the airport at 15 right now. And the satellite picture shows clouds are moving out. We'll see clear skies most of today. Temperature wise, 71 Kennedy, 68 New Braunfels, 60 in Kerrville, 67 right now in Hondo. And that temperature forecast takes us up into the 70s, I'd say about 1, 2 o'clock, and then we'll start to see the temperatures drop uh, with that front coming through. And then by 10 p.m., we're already in the 40s. And by tomorrow morning, we'll see temperatures in the low 30s. You combine that with the gusty winds, and that is the forecast wind chill tomorrow morning. 27 here in San Antonio, 
some 20s, maybe even some teens in the hill country. So get the jackets back out. You will want them tomorrow morning. The extended forecast, it's a pretty busy one. We've got 59 coming up tomorrow. Behind the front, it will be cooler. 65 Saturday, 68 Sunday. And then next week, a lot happening. But I think we'll have some rain chances coming back into play Monday and Tuesday, maybe even Wednesday. And it does look like we'll get a pretty nice looking cold front by the middle part of next week, guys. I think that could be a whole new segment. Nothing but button busting. Yeah, I, I think we'd mutton have a great busting. That following. Could be, that could be a tongue twister, couldn't it? <laughs> yes, Nothing it but mutton busting is what oh, I meant to say. Oh, no, there yeah. You go. Yeah. Well, it is a tradition. It has nothing to do with this. A, no, a separate tradition that can only happen at the Stock Show and Rodeo. It involves David Sears and good food. All right. Are you surprised? No. As always, he's accompanied by this year's Miss Rodeo Texas. So take a look as they walk and eat their way through the food court. Welcome to the food court. Last year we missed out on this because of the pandemic and all that ice that we had and the big snowstorm. So this year we're making up for some lost food fun with, of course, Miss Rodeo Texas. Hi, I'm Bobby Loran, Miss Rodeo Texas, and we're about to have some fried food fun, San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo style. Bobby, we're going to start with some fried shrimp. You like cocktail sauce on yours? I do, I do. Mm. That's a good start, wouldn't you say? That's excellent. So if you don't like fried fish, we got something for you. <laughs> we got a fried PBJ, a classic delight anyone can enjoy. Did All you right. say, is it like ooey gooey? Ooey gooey goodness. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow. So we're going to try something a little traditional, but also non-traditional. So fries with garlic and Parmesan on them. <laughs> That's right. Ooh, that is oh, traditionally non-traditional. Look that at looks that. looks amazing. Oh. I'm going to get this pretty one right here. Mm. I've never heard a fry <laughs> described as pretty, but they are pretty good. <laughs> right? <laughs> After shrimp, PB&J, and fries, you got to have some dessert, right? Right. Nothing like a fried Oreo. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and of course, you have to finish off your trip to the food court with a funnel cake. Oh, who needs a fork? <laughs> Come on. That's an excellent funnel cake. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Another successful tour. Cheers. Cheers. David Sears. Bobby Loran, KSAT 12 News. Well, that's a lot of fun. So on your screen right now, there's a QR code that will take you to all our rodeo content online, along with links to schedules and concert information. So you can also go to KSAT.com. 924, about 66 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, a look at how diversity is growing among medical staff at local hospitals. Welcome back. Last week, we recognized San Antonio's black medical pioneers. This week, we are hoping to see uh, the, let me start over here. Those who are hoping to walk in their footsteps. Okay. And already nationally recognized for its diversity, the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio is seeing more and more applications from African American students. Jessica DeGoyada tells us why more are applying and why it's not just recruitment efforts. These medical students show it. The future of medicine promises to be much more diverse. Applications overall went up 20% last year to the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Twice that many, 40% were African-American students. That's highly, highly encouraging. Ifine Anyoha is a third-year medical student from Dallas. As a curious college student, he shadowed his primary physician specializing in internal medicine. This was the first time I've seen a profession in which you could hug your your clientele, hug your patients. He says more African-American medical students like himself also can serve a greater purpose, even beyond healing their patients. We can, to some degree, help ease some of the hurt, ease some of the historical wrongs that were done. For the chief diversity officer at the Long School of Medicine. 
we see the fruits of our labor. Due in part, says Dr. Chiquita Collins, to the social justice movement in response to George Floyd's death in 2020. How can institutions take a more active role in ensuring that people from all walks of life feel respected and valued? The time is ripe. And so students are saying, we also want to be part of that. Cass Med High School students in the San Antonio Independent School District are already learning what it will take to go into medicine. And encourage a new generation of young African-American men and women to wear that white coat, step into that role, and be that excellence. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Just about 9.30 on your Thursday morning. And there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. If you're someone who puts salt on salt on salt, we're going to show you alternatives that are much healthier. And later, RJ has an update on the Spurs rodeo road trip with a nice win last night up in OKC. And as we head to break, a quick check of the roads with TransGuy. There's a look there at Highway 90 at Zarzamora looking better right now. We'll be right back. A horrific tragedy four years ago turned into a platform for love and education. Erin Castro Rios was murdered by her boyfriend in 2018 and during Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, her family honors her by serving others. As Courtney Friedman explains, a fundraising event this weekend will ensure other teens get to continue the life Erin was on track to live. I've always said if it could happen to her, it could happen to anyone. That she'd speak up for herself and someone else that needed it. Fearless, you know, she was spicy. Erin Rios Castro was murdered on her 19th birthday by her on and off again boyfriend, who was just sentenced to 35 years in prison for the murder and another 20 years for assaulting her years before. It starts out nice. It's a grooming process, I believe. Before Erin knew it, she was almost brainwashed. She wasn't the same Erin. The old Erin wouldn't have let somebody treat her the way she was being treated uh, towards the end. That's why Erin's mom, Rena Castro, set aside her pain to create the Erin Rios Castro Foundation, visiting schools to teach kids about dating violence and healthy relationships. You have a voice, use it you know, and love yourself and know that you're worth it and that you're not alone. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You're not alone. Get help. The foundation also gives out scholarships for teens that have been affected by domestic violence. Affected in any way. Had it been yourself affected, a loved one, you know, maybe you've seen your parents or your neighbors or your aunt, uncle, cousin, friend. This Saturday is the annual 5K event that funds those scholarships and Rena hopes the public will come out to support the cause. We all want to help the next generation and the next group of girls. I see Erin and so many girls that I talk to and it, um, it breaks my heart and I want them to break that chain. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And Saturday's run starts at 9 a.m. at Woodlawn Lake Park. Registration is at 8. Our Courtney Friedman will MC the event, and there will be community leaders, games, prizes, and resource booths. Now, to apply for the scholarship or register for the run, go to the Foundation's website. We have a link on ksat.com. And look outside with live cam. Uh, we're at 66 degrees now, but what an interesting morning. It has been. We, you know, we had a little bit of rain on the radar earlier this morning sunrise. We didn't get any here in San Antonio. Boy, we needed it. We really do need the rain around here. It just uh, did not happen. It's pushing east. Now we've got dry air coming in. We've got gusty winds. That's a bad combination. Let me show you the setup. You can see where that initial front uh, sets up east of us now, and that's taking all the moisture and humidity with it. We've got a secondary front that drops south a little bit later today. That brings in the cooler air. But we do have wind advisories and uh, uh, high fire danger where you see that pink color here around San Antonio that represents fire danger with those gusty winds in the dry air. Wind advisory is also posted for parts of Texas and then you go north. There is winter weather issues as you get into northern parts of Oklahoma and parts of Kansas. Here is, here's a look at the temperatures 66 at the airport 61 Bernie stage 64 Canyon Lake 68 New Braunfels 70s for some places like Pleasanton and Catula and I think we'll Get into the 70s today briefly here in San Antonio before that cooler air starts to work in. So here's a look at the forecast. 71 by noontime, but down to 60 by 5 p.m. We're going to see gusts to 35 miles per hour out of the west and northwest. And then temperatures fall into the 30s tonight into tomorrow morning. And by the time you wake up tomorrow, wind chill values will likely be in the 20s. 
So significant change here. Pretty good looking weekend though. We'll take a look at that and we'll look ahead to some rain chances next week coming up in a few minutes, guys. Justin, thank you. Quick look at Transguide right now. Normal slowdowns around town. Things are looking good at 410 at Evers, but the normal spots you would think of, especially the construction zones on Loop 1604 on the north and northwest side continue in both east and westbound lanes. Well, you might have a salt habit and not even know about it. Too much sodium, of course, isn't good for any of us, but let's face it, salt makes so many foods taste better. Still, there are healthier ways to kick up the flavor. 12 on your sides, Marilyn Morris, on which salts are better for you and which alternatives you may want to try. Christopher Maimoni is a major foodie who loves to share. During the week, though, he eats healthy. The body doesn't process food the way it did when you were younger, so... Uh... Um, I'm just cutting back on sodium and fats. I'm basically in lower salt, lower sodium in general. Why do we crave salt? Salt or sodium chloride is a flavor enhancer that can boost the intensity of a dish. It can not only enhance sweetness, but also can mask tastes like bitterness. There are a lot of different salts, but they're not all the same when it comes to sodium levels. The density of the crystals makes a difference. A quarter teaspoon of fine table salt has more sodium than a quarter teaspoon of coarse or flaked salt. And what about alternative products? We wanted to determine how the products worked as a salt swap to see if we could tell the difference and if they were better or worse than regular salt. Taste testers tried six products on rice, scrambled eggs, and popcorn. Here are the tastiest. They said Morton Light Salt, 50% less sodium, tasted most like the real thing. In rice and eggs, it was hard to tell the difference, but popcorn tasted slightly bitter. MSG products add a savory flavor. Testers said accent seasoning tasted more brothy than salty, but liked it on popcorn, but they detected a metallic flavor to rice and eggs. Nutritional yeast can be used as a sodium swap in veggie soups and salads. Tester said the Bob's Red Mill Large Flake Nutritional Yeast had a cheesy umami flavor. So depending on your taste, there are ways to shake the salt. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. 939, about 67 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. An update on the Rodeo Road Trip next with RJ. The Spurs wrap up the first leg of the rodeo road trip with a big win in Oklahoma City. Not too shabby. RJ Marquez is back to break down the Spurs win and what's next fill the silver for the silver and black. RJ. Yeah, guys. So it was all Derek White's fault, right? That's the narrative. <laughs> was that it? Hearing, <laughs> that wasn't it. Well, I keep hearing from Spurs fans on Twitter, on social media saying that like, oh, thank God we got rid of Derek White Aww. because now the Spurs are playing a lot better. I, I don't think that's the case. I wouldn't say that. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, just these guys are kind of rounding up into yeah. form a little bit. And DeJounte Murray, again, guys, has just been unbelievable as he gets ready to compete in his first All-Star game to Congrats there to DJ. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of highlights from this game last night. Again, wrapping up the first leg of the rodeo road trip there for our San Antonio Spurs. You see Lonnie Walker. Lonnie actually has been playing a lot better since the trade. And Devin Vassell, who's now the starting shooting guard, has been playing pretty well as well. Look at Devin making a couple big shots there. Devin scored 15 points last night for the silver and black. And again, Spurs got out to a nice lead here. Second half, kind of had to grind things out. You're looking right there, Josh Richardson, number seven. He was the guy who came over in that deal from Boston. He and Romeo Langford was the other player that came over in that deal for the Celtics. And uh, Josh Richardson saw his first playing time yesterday, scored a three-pointer there, had a nice little game. And Spurs, uh, again, this was not the prettiest win, kind of had to grind things out, but they had six players in double figures. They win this one 114 to 106. So they improved to three and two on the rodeo road trip. And the second leg will be at Washington, at Miami, and at Memphis. But they're going to get a nice break here, guys, a nine-day break, because these games don't start up until February 25th. You remember the All-Star break the all-star weekend is this weekend they're now two games back of portland for the playing tournament so let's go ahead and hear a little bit from pop and kelvin johnson after this win in oklahoma city the last game of that trip is tough everybody wants to go home and so i thought they hung in there pretty good did a good job against a really well coached aggressive okc team we got out on them in the first half you know second half was a grind but uh, you could tell everybody wanted it you know we you know we knew we was going to break and we knew we wanted to go on break on a high note uh, so we knew we had to take care of business and uh, just keep our foot on foot on the gas. 
All right, guys, KJ right there leading the team with 22 points in that win. And again, the Spurs are now two games back of the play-in tournament as they get ready for this nice little break. Uh, DeJounte Murray is going to be competing in the All-Star game this Sunday and uh, at Cleveland. And DeJounte Murray, I'm, um, excuse me, Kelvin Johnson was saying that he really, that he's excited to see DJ play and he wants him to do something exciting. So like between the legs, some crazy dunks, something like that. So that should be pretty <laughs> fun this weekend. Also, wanted to mention, guys, we are on Pop Watch. Mm. <laughs> Pop Watch here because last night, Greg Popovich, yes, the longtime Spurs head coach, became the second most winningest head coach in NBA history. And if I'm looking at the numbers here correctly, he's now only two wins behind Don Nelson. So Pop has reached 1,333 wins. Two wins behind Don Nelson, so he needs three wins now to break the all-time record. He passed Lenny Wilkins, wow. longtime Sonics, Hawks, mm -hmm. Cavs head coach. And, of course, you see there's a more of the top five here. Jerry Sloan is in that top five, Pat Riley. So a bunch of Mount Rushmore coaches there. Well, we knew, we knew Pop was kind of in rare company anyway, yeah. and this uh, they just prove it. So two games away, mm -hmm. and so theoretically that could happen after the All-Star break. It could, and look, I'm not hoping that the Spurs lose any games here, but I actually would like to see them do it here at home mm -hmm. because yeah. they're going to come back, have a slew of home games after the uh, rodeo road trip, which they always do. So I'd like to see him break the record here. He's probably not going to acknowledge any sure. of it. I mean, sure. yesterday, yeah, he was like, I just want to get home. <laughs> I think most of the guys. <laughs> even when you ask him, though, it's – he just never acknowledges any wow. of this stuff. I don't even think he was asked about passing Lenny Wilkins last night. Unbelievable. All right, so we're on the lookout for that. Um, I know we did, don't get to go back in time, RJ, but um, mm -hmm. I, I love playing what if every once in a while. Can you imagine okay. mm -hmm. what would have happened if DeMar DeRozan had not left wow. and gone to Chicago? and had a remarkable year here versus yeah. in the Windy City. Yeah, so we've been having a lot of talks about this. I know uh, David Sears has been uh, pretty vocal, as usual, about this <laughs> type of stuff. Um, I, I, I think DeMar last year, I thought DeMar played hard throughout his mm -hmm. entire time here in San Antonio, but there was kind of a different edge to him right now because mm -hmm. The Bulls are kind of more of a contending mode. So DeMar was great his entire time here. Mm -hmm. He kind of had a different role. He basically had to be the playmaker, creator for these guys. Now, as you mentioned, Mark, DeJounte Murray has kind of stepped into that role a little bit. Right. So you wonder if DeMar could have played a little bit more off of DeJounte and done what he's doing in Chicago here. But I'm sure DeMar is pretty happy. He's getting a lot of national attention, too, yeah, a lot of national true. profiles he, and stuff. Yeah. Uh, agree 100%. Uh, it, DeJounte would not probably be having the year he is. And there's something to be said for a change of scenery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. that's exactly what DeMar needed to be DeMar. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, as we mentioned, DeJounte just able to grow and some of these other guys able to grow. But the Derek White slander, that's what I don't know. <laughs> Dude, yeah, we don't get that either, do we? How rude. Yeah, I was, a, yeah. I was upset to see him go. And right. if she says it's rude, it's yeah, rude, people. Rude. I, yeah, it's that's rude. rude. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't want him to go, yeah. but I mean, it's yeah. it's cool that the Spurs are winning, but don't blame him for yeah. it. And, yeah. and Derek White's actually been pretty good with Boston. You knew he would. He's a yeah. great teammate, great guy in the locker room. A lot of the guys here were sad to see him go. We, saw, we got to see Josh Richardson play last night. So, well, so I'll, I'll go back guys. to this default. 99.99% uh, of Spurs fans are very gracious, and it goes back to, yeah. Derek, good luck wherever yes. you wind up. Even Absolutely. Boston. Yes, yes. definitely. Right. And guys, get some rest. Go Spurs go. So we go, Spurs go Spurs go. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Good RJ. Let's go check in with Justin now. Mm -hmm. Did you see Jakob last night? Heck of a game. Yes. 17. <laughs> it, was, it was a good game. You played hard inside. Uh, let's look at the uh, big picture here across the state of Texas, guys. We had a uh, storm system moved through last night, uh, at least a frontal boundary. And this brought in some drier air. It is bringing in drier air as we speak. Did not bring us any rain. It's going to bring a ton of rain in places like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. In fact, some severe weather expected there today. Here across Texas, sort of a dynamic setup here. We have this initial front, and then we have a secondary front that pushes in a little bit later this afternoon. That brings in the cooler air later tonight. But in the meantime, what we're concerned with is this dry air. Dew points right now around 30 here in San Antonio and dropping. And we've got drier air that will continue to funnel in. We'll probably see these dew points jump off into the 20s. The moisture air getting shoved off to the east. Uh, then you look at the wind gusts. We've got some gusts now to 25 miles per hour. We'll see gusts probably pick up a little bit more into the afternoon. And as we look at the wind forecast, Probably in that range, I'd say gusts 25 to 30 throughout the day. Initially a northwest wind, and then as our front comes through, more of a northerly wind. And it stays gusty going into tonight as well, even into tomorrow morning. It's probably not until tomorrow afternoon that these winds finally calm some. 
And then you add into all of this the drought situation that we have underway here in South Texas, an extreme drought. This area you see, see here in red down around Carrizo Springs and Catula, but even around Hondo, San Antonio, we're dealing with drought conditions. So my main concern with wildfires today, and there is a fire threat here, is going to be mainly west of I-35. I think the entire area has a threat of it, but the biggest threat will be west of I-35 and probably south of Highway 90. There is a look at the red flag warning. And what this means, as I said, is that there's a high fire danger just based on all of those components that we just showed you. That's going to go until 8 p.m. tonight. Here's the setup right now. We've got blue skies, 66 degrees, northwesterly winds at about 15, gusting to 25, and that dew point is falling. Temperature-wise, 68 in New Braunfels, 63 Comfort, 61 in Bandera, 67 in Hondo. You'll find some cooler stuff as some of that cooler air is trying to work in up across the hill country and then warmer numbers down to the south. 71 in Pleasanton, 73 right now in Bevo. Let's look at the forecast. So by, I'd say, midday to around 1 p.m., that's when we see our warmest temperatures, at least here in San Antonio, 74. We could get close to 80 in a few spots south of town and then places like Kerrville, We'll already be feeling the cooler air by 1 p.m. 59 degrees there by say 10 p.m. It's getting chilly out there. We've got the cold air working on 45 here in San Antonio, some 30s in the hill country. And could we see a freeze tomorrow morning? I think San Antonio will be right on the brink. The hill country for sure will see some freezing temperatures and then south of San Antonio just above that mark. But it'll be still breezy. And with those temperatures, wind chill values will be in the 20s. This is what it will feel like around 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. 27 here in town, wind chill values potentially in the teens tomorrow morning. So this will be quite a change. As we said earlier, grab the jacket. You will want it tomorrow. Now the good news here is that uh, by the weekend, temperatures moderate a little bit. It should be pretty nice. Some increasing clouds on Sunday, 68 degrees. 59 tomorrow, by the way. And Saturday morning, we'll get close to another freeze here in town. Next week gets active. We've got some rain chances coming back into play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and another cold front, which will cool us down on Wednesday. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We've got a story on KSAT.com about the big development that's broke ground up near Bernie. So the headline reads, HEB may anchor massive new development near Bernie. So we're excited about that. The subheadline, 118-acre ranch property, part of San Antonio's ever-growing urban sprawl. Supposedly, it will add restaurants, retail space, residences, and parks between Interstate 10 and Balcones Creek. Uh, Valcor Commercial Real Estate, developer of the project, announced in August that roughly a 106,000 square foot grocery tenant would anchor the first phase of the build. And in Thursday, a press release, the company did not release a reason for the construction delays, though. Bear County records show HEB bought almost 14 acres at this site in January of 2021. Jonathan Collins, a managing director, confirmed the Texas grocer would be the main anchor of this project. What's weird is this is the same general area that Bucky's has been talking about building at for years. And last oh. word was they wouldn't do anything out there till 2023. So stay tuned. Mm, we shall see. But I, I'm a fan of this, of course. <laughs> we all are. <laughs>